All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our program this evening. My name is Adam Lehman, and I am privileged to be the president and CEO of Hill International. I am coming to you from the great state of Maryland, Rockville, Maryland, to be exact. Beautiful evening here. Hope you all enjoyed your Sunday, your holidays, uh, and are getting ready for an interesting program tonight. Uh, as uh, we shared in the chat, if you're comfortable, please turn your cameras on, uh, particularly once we get into uh, Q&A later, because it's always great to uh, see who's participating. I want to go ahead and just do a little bit of uh, introduction to the program tonight and to the College Fair itself. Uh, the College Fair is part of a, a larger initiative that we call Bridge, Hillel Bridge, and Hillel Bridge is a set of activities all geared towards supporting uh, the critical transition from high school to Hillel, from high school to college, university life is part of that. We're excited to be kicking off our fourth uh, biannual version of the fair. Uh, we've been doing this twice a year uh, for the past two years, and we really hope that the next few days of programs are helpful for you, are fun, interesting, and just provide a new window into this uh, important transition. As part of the transition, the goal of the College Fair is to share tools, guidance, support, uh, even before your students arrive on college campuses. And it can even create a sense of community. We are all here and in this together. Um, so uh, for high school juniors and their parents, hold on one moment, did not prepare for the rapid fire family text string, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, got that on do not disturb now. Um, uh, for juniors and their parents, the College Fair website uh, can be helpful in making decisions about where uh, your child will be going to school, what school will best fit them. And for seniors and their parents, we do hope the College Fair helps to orient you to the overall Hillel world, to Jewish life on campus more broadly. So you and your student know what to expect and, and you can all hit the ground running next fall. And I, I do wanna emphasize that for everyone, uh, as you go through this fair and even following the college fair, please know that Hillel is here for you throughout the process. And that includes staff that you'll have a chance to see tonight but in particular, our local Hill staff and student leaders who really look forward to welcoming you wherever you find yourself uh, on your college journey. As, as a quick side note, I, I love our work at Hillel. We're really truly blessed to be able to support Jewish students, Jewish communities on campus, and as a Jewish student community, support the broader campus and world. And the key ingredient, what makes this work so special are the incredible professionals and student leaders that you'll find at uh, Campus Hillel. So please, wherever you are in process, wherever you visit, uh, I always encourage people to avail themselves of the chance to stop by Hillel, uh, go ahead and meet with professionals and student leaders. You will not regret it. Um, speaking of not regretting it, we have two fantastic speakers joining us tonight, and I'm going to share just brief introductions about both of them. Uh, first of all, we have Julie lithcott Hames. Uh, she's the former Dean of Freshmen and Undergraduate Advising at Stanford University. I think I've heard of Stanford. It's a small school somewhere, maybe on the West Coast. Uh, we're really excited to bring Julie back. She um, graced the Hill at Home virtual stage once before, speaking on an event that focused on creating welcoming spaces for Black students. Julie is the New York Times bestselling author of How to Raise an Adult, and her third book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, has been called a groundbreakingly frank guide to adulthood. Uh, so thank you so much, Julie, for being here and being such an important part of tonight's program. Um, I now want to also introduce Sarah Frank. Uh, Sarah is also an author. She was uh, published uh, as a teen, uh, you know, in book form as well as as a poet. 
uh, growing up uh, in Tampa, Florida. And Sarah is now a first year student at Brown University, majoring in writing and psychology. And we're like delighted that Sarah has chosen to dedicate some of her time and clearly very passionate energy uh, to life at Hillel through Brown RISD Hillel as an active student leader. Um, Sarah received Hillel's Handeli First Year Student Scholarship for demonstrating a record of leadership and volunteer service in her local community. Sarah, we're, we're so excited to have you share your story of your own transition from high school to college and the role that Hill has played in that journey. Uh, before we move on, I do wanna thank uh, our Global Student Experience team for organizing this college fair and introduce Oren Persing. Oren can give a wave. He has that very thick but still groomed beard. Uh, Oren is going to be our MC tonight. If you have any questions or technical issues, you can direct them uh, to Oren. And at this point, it is a distinct pleasure to be able to pass the mic to Sarah, who's going to share her experience and student perspective. Then we'll we'll move to Julie from there. Sarah, the mic is yours, please. Thank you, Adam. It is an honor to have you as the CEO of Halal pass the mic to me. Um, so like Adam said, I'm a current freshman at Brown and I'm super involved in Brown RISD Hillel. Our Hillel is actually both for Brown students and for Rhode Island School of Design students. So it's an especially big community here. Um, and I absolutely love being involved at Hillel and I love being involved at Brown. Um, but being here when I first got here was not always easy. Um, it always seemed to me like lots of people would just go to college and like everything would be fine and they'd be happy and like everything would work out and there's no stress. Um, and for me and for a lot of people, um here and at other colleges it's not always as easy as it might appear online or in movies um so for me my transition from high school to Hillel brought its fair share of both challenges and successes um namely the first one was that when I first got to college I was very homesick my god had mentioned I'm from Tampa Florida um and Brown is located in Providence Rhode Island so Florida to New England is quite a ways away, um, about a three hour plane flight, and I'd never even moved houses. So moving a thousand miles away was quite the change. Um, and I very much missed my parents. I missed being at home with them. I missed sitting down to the dinner table and eating with them or watching TV together. And so being on my own, in my own room, in my own place was very weird. And it felt um, very not like home to me yet. Um, I also struggled with a lot of FOMO, um, which stands for fear of missing out for those that don't know. And there's so much that goes on here at Brown during orientation. Um, and several other schools also have lots and lots of events and you have to pick and choose which ones you, you go to. And, you know, if you have the energy to stay up until midnight at random events. And so that was really hard for me to like pick and choose which things I wanted to go to, because if I didn't go, it sort of felt like I was missing out. So College was, you know, so much all at once. Um, and there's so many ways that they, the, the school in general at Brown, like helps you transition into college life. Um, but one of the things that helped me the most was getting involved at Hillel. Um, and I distinctly remember when I was choosing colleges, this was like April, um, 2021, before I had decided to go to Brown, I reached out to Brown Hillel. And I um, had toured Brown Hillel in like June, 2019. And I had talked to the lady at the front desk. Um, her name was Rhonda and she was so nice. She gave me her email in June, 2019. So here we are in April, 2021, like almost two full years later. And I still had the Brown RISD Hillel sticky note pad that she had given me. And on the top sticky note was her email. And it had been two years. I was like, there's no way that she remembers me. There's no way I remember her, but like she meets tons of people. But I sent her an email um when i committed to brown and i was like rhonda like i know you don't remember me we talked for like 10 minutes two years ago but i'm coming to hillel and i hope you're still there because i'm really excited to get involved at brown RISD hillel she emailed me back in 20 minutes and she was like sarah we are so excited to welcome you home to hillel just know like you have a place here like i've copied um this woman named lex on this email and like she's totally open to setting up a zoom call with you to like talk about brown RISD hillel and like coming to campus 
and she gave me a call. Um, it was so nice. I spoke to both Rhonda and Lex before even setting foot on campus. Um, and that was so nice, like knowing that I'm moving far away from home, but I'm going to create another home here. Uh, and Hillel quickly became, like I said, a home once I got to campus. I go there to study, I go there to eat. There's always good food um, at Brown Rose to Hillel. I go there just to like connect with friends, sometimes just to stop by and say hi, especially if I see Rhonda still working at the front desk. I was going, hey Rhonda. Um, and it's so nice like having people who are who are in your corner. And even though my family is in a different corner, a thousand miles away, I have a brown RISD Hillel family here, which is really, really nice. Um, also, one of the reasons I'm here to talk to you guys at all is I was, am one of the recipients of the Handeli Scholarship, which is a scholarship for student leaders um, entering their first year of college. And so I was awarded it somewhat around this time last year. Um, and I'm gonna be using it for a sophomore year, stacking up with other scholarships is really helping me afford to be at a school like Brown. Um, and before I wrap up my little spiel on how amazing Hillel is and my personal transition from high school to Hillel, um, I'm gonna read an excerpt from my application that I submitted to the Handeli Scholarship that I like to think the people at Hillel liked, especially because they pointed it out to me. So I'm gonna read it and end it on that lovely note. Okay. Here's the excerpt. I love that Jews are incredibly connected to each other, but just as much, I love that Jews are connected to the world around us. One of my favorite prayers is one my grandma always reads at Passover. It's called, I am a Jew. One of the lines reads, I am a Jew because in every place where suffering weeps, the Jew weeps. This selflessness, this inherent love for other people is a trademark of Judaism. We are a relatively small group and yet we are ever present. We have compassion and empathy for other minorities, for other people and for other nations. Throughout my life, I've had varying levels of connection to Judaism. When I was in elementary school, I had yet to understand what religion even meant. When I was in middle school, I'd yet to figure out what I believe in. While in high school, I realized Judaism is more than a set of beliefs. It's a culture, rich with traditions and full of meaning. It's a community, a group of people I am connected to, even without ever meeting. It's a way to live your life, a set of values and mantras that help us learn and grow. It's given me insight and compassion, perspectives and family. For these reasons and more, I am incredibly proud to be Jewish." Close quote. So that is the end of the excerpt. I am also incredibly proud to be here and to speaking to you guys. Um, so thank you so much for having me. And I think later in the q and I might be able to answer some of your questions along with Julie, who I'm also incredibly honored to be speaking with. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so Sarah's going to hang out. We'll get to some Q&A later. Um, and uh, if questions have come up for Sarah, um, obviously that, that would be a good opportunity. Um, as you were talking about walking into Hillel for the first time and, and Rhonda, it was making me remember my first time walking into a Hillel. Your Rhonda was my Susan, um, but it, it was just nice to like think back to that. That was like 2001. Um, so it was a while ago at this point, but uh, a very familiar story. Um, I also just want to say that um, as we were talking about inviting Sarah to come uh, hang out with us this evening, we were obviously excited for Sarah to tell her story as an involved student leader. I don't think I even realized at the time back then that you were an author, so it was really neat to learn more about Sarah's story um, and a little, just a little bit of serendipity with um, uh, Sarah getting to join us alongside Julie. So, um, absolutely. No further ado. Yeah, thank you so much, um, and Sarah will hang out. And I wanted to um, pass the mic to Julie. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, how I wish we were in person and could literally pass the mic. But it's also amazing that technology enables us to participate from wherever we are. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, Oren, thank you so much. Um, Adam, Jesse, Paula, anyone else who had anything to do with this, I'm grateful. Um, Sarah, so lovely to uh, benefit from the wisdom of your words. Thank you for gracefully, graciously, um, vulnerably sharing your experience. It's so important. Um, my work as an author and speaker is, I think, writ large to try to help us feel less alone on our journey. Um, uh, I really feel that in my gut somewhere that um, I want to be the type of person who helps humans. And many of us are that way. And 
Um, so that's, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here with joy. Um, why don't we pop in the chat since we do have so many folks here, just uh, city state, where, where are you? It's always nice to see kind of who's in the room, air quotes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here in Silicon Valley, Northern California, Palo Alto. Um, I am in the shadow of Stanford University, um, a lot of universities here in the Bay Area. And um, I'm really honored to get to be part of the Hillel College Fair. Um, I want to be, uh, I want to let you know, if, in case you don't, that I, although I'm not Jewish, I'm a black and biracial person, the child of a white British Methodist mother and a African-American father. Great to see all these places. San Mateo, Rowan Hepler, I was just in San Mateo two hours ago. It's nice to see you here. Just giving folks a shout out from wherever they are, Virginia Beach, Detroit, Tampa Bay, Georgia, Atlanta, Rockville, Orlando, Forest Hills. My college roommate was from Forest Hills. Look at that. Okay, so it's great to see people here from all over the country. Um, and um, I am black and biracial um, and not Jewish um, and not particularly religious. Um, I have been a member of a number of different religions and find my sense of spiritual belonging um, in my brain and in my heart and in my soul and um, very much believe that there is more to this world than we can name through science or philosophy or math or whatever, uh, but I don't have a particular religious adherence. And yet my mother-in-law is an Orthodox Jew. I've been partnered with her son for, for 34 years. We met in college and I'm pretty sure she wasn't expecting him to bring home someone like me. Um, and yet he did. And um, my mother-in-law embraced me and us in our relationship, um, which I, of course, cherish. Um, There's so many people who set out to create barriers between us. And there were other members of his family that wanted to create barriers. And there were members of my family that wanted barriers too. But my mother-in-law um, has loved me from the first. I went to shul with her. Uh, in an orthodox um, situation, the men were here and the women were here. And I was like, wow, I've never had that before. Um, you know, coming to appreciate um, what a rabbi is, what a cantor is, um, attending a Passover Seder and reading the Haggadah for the first time um, and appreciating what similarity there is between the experience of uh, members of the African diaspora and Jews. Uh, to feel real solidarity and connection in our struggle, in our history as persecuted people, in our histories as mistrusted people, people about whom there are negative stereotypes. Um, we are so different and yet historically we have so much in common. And I've always been able to locate a sense of belonging whenever I'm invited to be a part of the Jewish community. So today I'm with you virtually with Hillel in two days, I'm at Rodef Shalom in McLean, Virginia, um, which is an amazing uh, community. And, um, you know, you made the point, Sarah, that Jewish people, your grandmother has this favorite prayer that she reads at Passover about Jews having compassion for all who weep. And, um, and I so feel that. And I, too, try to embody that as an African-American. And I, you know, the suffering and struggle of my people gives me a lot of empathy for all humans who struggle. Um, what I also appreciate about the Jewish community is it seems wherever I go, whatever town, whatever region of this country, the Jewish community is often providing the lifeblood uh, talks on important subjects, opportunities to learn a thing or two, take a class, join a group, right? Connect, discuss, eat, celebrate, mourn, like just there's this tremendous offering, and don't mean to be stereotypical in saying this, but <clears throat> I've really been struck by the fact that the Jewish community is often the heart of a community, even if the community isn't majority Jewish. Um, there's such intentionality about creating community, fostering belonging, fostering thriving, and I respect you for it. So I'm doubly, triply honored to get to be here. Um, Here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I'm a former Dean at Stanford. I have a lot of thoughts about the transition to college. 
challenge. I'm a mom. I got a 22 year old son, 20 year old daughter right here in Silicon Valley is where they were raised. I have a lot of mom thoughts. Uh, I'm also the author of books now. I've written a book on how parents can get in the way of kids. I've got a TED talk related to the harm of overparenting, which some of us, nobody here, but we all know people who are doing it. I've done it. I'm a fierce advocate for young people getting to figure out their own path and life. And that's really the subject of my most recent book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. So I'm here as a former dean, mom, and author. Often the author in me has wisdom, the mom in me is still trying to learn. So please know if you feel triggered, parents, by anything I say, I'm not pointing my finger at you. I can't see you. I don't know you, right? Whatever I'm telling you, I've learned because of the path I've traveled, okay? Whatever comes up for you, notice it. Whether you're a kid or a parent, whatever I say, if something's like makes you have a feeling, you know, note that somewhere. That's valid. That's a clue from you to you that I've said something that matters to you. And your reaction to what I have to say matters. So notice it. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just do a brief overview for where I think parents are and a brief overview for where I think young people are, and then give some advice and then take some questions. Um, why don't we just uh, put in the chat, um, it'd be nice to get a sense of the mix. Like, are we pretty much half and half parents and kids or is every kid here with a couple of parents? And so it's really only one third, two third. I'd love to have a sense of who's in the audience. So light up the chat with, if you're a kid, tell us what grade you are in high school and parent there, Gary Frank went first. Are you the parent of Sarah Frank, Gary? Okay, that's adorable. Yeah, that's okay. my dad. Your dad, very good. Parent of a ninth grader, okay. 11th grade, okay, 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 good. Lot of 11th graders here, lot of juniors. Great, 10th, okay, all right, nice, okay. Are there any seniors here? Is there anyone who's actually going, thinks they're going to college this fall? I'm not seeing it. I think the seniors are like, yeah, I'm good. I don't need this. <laughs> and the juniors are like, tell me all the information. Okay, senior from New York, Chase, Nuss bomb. cool, cool. All right. Um, so that's how this is going to go. And we'll have plenty of time for your questions. And I will definitely be inviting Sarah to join me in answering the questions because I'm a 54 year old Gen Xer and I've got my opinions based on the identities I've shared with you. Sarah is a um, Gen Z and, um, you know, has her own experience. And uh, together, we're going to try to support you. All right. So parents. <clears throat> If you're a kid, I'm about to talk to you, but first I got to talk to the parents. Parents, I want you to know this. Our job as parents is to put ourselves out of a job, okay? We've succeeded at this parenting thing when our offspring can thrive in the world without us. That's the imperative of a mammal parent. Elephants, dogs, they do it, we do it. <clears throat> we get about 18, 20, 22, 29, whatever it is, we get a bunch of years with ours. And these are years when we're supposed to be continually teaching them more and more so that they can go. Not to say they're not going to come back. Of course, they'll come back if we've been loving, if we've been respectful, they'll come back. But we need to know in our bones that our kids can fend without us. That's to succeed, to have the confidence that no matter what happens to us, they'll be fine because they can do for themselves. Now, sometimes young people have significant challenges, special needs, difficulties. I respect that. Some people will need attending to longer in life, but be mindful that outside of big special needs, every young person can and will be capable of making their way out in that world, okay? And we want that for them. That is to have the deep confidence that they're gonna be just fine. I'm passing my genes on, right? Like just whole genetic, biologic, evolution, human connection, community thing. Like that's our job. I don't want you to feel sad about that. Oh, they're not gonna need me. One parent today, I was giving a talk a couple hours ago. She's like, I've spent so much time on my kids 
you know, like their, their life has been my life always. And what am I going to do when they go to college? And I told her, I respect that. I get it. And we don't ever want our love to be need that our kids then have to fill. Like you can feel the separation and feel sad. You can feel right. Take that to your therapist. I'm serious about that. Talk to your therapist, talk to your friends about your emotions, which are very valid, but don't heap that need on your kid who is trying to unfurl their wings and go wherever it is. Okay. Trust that the less hovery you are, the more room you create for ease and connection. Okay. You might need to get a massive new hobby. If your last kid is going off or your only kid is going off and all of a sudden you've got all of this time because <laughs> you used to, right. You may need to decide, okay, now's the time for this hobby that I've been putting off for 18 years because you are going to have time to fill because your kid's not going to be there day in, day out anymore. And that's something you should be excited about. They're growing and, and you're growing too, I think is my point. So I want to congratulate you parents. You've gotten your kid with love and support and understanding and resources and opportunities that you've offered values, community. Your kid has arrived at this point, whatever grade they are, like, look, wow, you've got this kid who is becoming their older version of themselves. And I want you to delight in who they are and to know that they are their own individual given to you by God or the universe or however, whatever your belief system is around all of this. Okay. They are not your property. You are the grownups entrusted with their care until they can care for themselves there's a humility inherent in that. They're not your pet. They're not your project. They're not your dog on a leash, okay? That you've entered into the Westminster dog show, going for best in class. They're a human and they're figuring themselves out. So I wanna congratulate you parents. Um, and um, I want you to know that what your kids need to thrive out in the world, in college, community college, military, gap year, workplace, whatever, is their choice after high school. They need agency, which is the sense of, I can, I can do stuff. I can try to figure this out. It's a sense of one's own capacity to try and make something happen, okay? They also need a sense of resilience out there, which is the sense I can cope when things go badly because things will go badly. To all of us, things bad things will happen. Okay. Our kids need that resilience. That's like, all right, that was awful. Deep breath, learn from it, move on. Okay. They need to be able to ask for help outside of our home, outside of high school. What I'm saying is they need to be able to talk to strangers, which can be problematic if their life has been, don't talk to strangers. Now life is full of strangers. They need to be able to self-advocate for what they need and listen to what others need roommates, classmates. Okay. So I want you parents to be asking yourself, what are we doing at home right now to facilitate the development of agency in our kid or kids, resilience in our kids. And that sense of they can start to figure stuff out, talk to strangers, get problems, solve their own problems, etc. I want you to ask, what are you doing? that facilitates that, what are you doing that gets in the way of those things? Parents, okay, that's you. Kids, I know, I'm, I'm here, I'm talking to you, yes. I know you're like, why is she talking to the parents? I'm here, okay. Man, am I excited for you. I just love, just listening to Sarah talk lit me up because as a college dean, my job was to give a darn about my students. And there's something about these years that you're entering that are so amazing in the life of a human. You do more growing between 18 and 22 than at any other time in life, except when you're a toddler, you know, just like learning to stand and walk and eat, you know, solid food. Like you're going to grow massively. And it's so weird and awkward and fun and amazing. Every grown up, everyone older than you on this call remembers back to them own, their own selves at 16, 17, 18, 19, like, 
Okay, it's a process. It can be ugly before it's beautiful. That's normal. And I'm just here with such excitement for you entering this phase of life. Um, so here you are emerging to the end of childhood, emerging into your adulthood. And um, for some of you, we have very few seniors in the house. Um, okay, I see Hannah and Shina. Okay, Chase, right? Maybe some others, right? You've got a big decision to make. May 1, woo, if you're going to college, like this is a big time, right? Maybe you know where you're going. Maybe you don't know where you're going. Maybe you're not Maybe you're not going anywhere next year. That's fine too. Um, but you're graduating high school most likely. And that's a huge transition. And juniors, I know you're headed into this, you know, this sort of final spring and fall until all of these decisions about next year, the year beyond get set. Um, it's scary. I know, I get that. And um, it's also amazing what's coming. What's coming is independence, freedom, from everything from what to wear, to how to do your hair, to who to be in relationship with, to what to study, what career, like, okay. And along with all this independent, some of the parents like, wait a minute, no, 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 don't tell them that. But I'm here to tell them that parents, because they're not a dog on your leash. They're here to be their own person. That's what I'm rooting for. And I want you to support them in being who they are. Okay. Along with all this independence and freedom and choice is responsibility. Yes. Adulting comes with a lot of responsibility and your task young folk is to get better and better at better and better at thinking and doing for yourself. You were once an infant in a high chair and they began to feed you mashed up food mashed carrots, mashed peas, mashed squash, these little pureed vegetables for infants on little tiny plastic spoons. You were once that person, pretty helpless, totally cared for, taken care of, looked out for by others. And in adulthood, you're more or less your own responsibility, which doesn't mean you're alone. Doesn't mean you don't still get help. But it means you kind of walk through life like, yeah, I'm on it. I know I got to take care of business. My body is my responsibility. My belongings are my responsibility. My bills are my responsibility. I call this taking care of business, body, belongings, bills. Okay. These are the basics of like just being able to fend for yourself. And you want that, even though it's sort of work, there's this delicious psychological hit that comes from like, I handled it. I handled it. You know, there was a thing and I had to deal with it. I handled it. That feels good psychologically, even if it might be hard along the way. So um, your task is to get better and better at thinking and doing for yourself and moving from being once this infant to being this real uh, freestanding or independent, not to be ableist, like this person who can more or less look after their own selves while asking for help when you need it and being in relationship with other humans. But this is the arc and you're like here, okay? You gotta be thinking for yourself, what do I wanna study? What am I good at doing? Who are the people I really like to be around? What are the identities that I know to be the identities I carry? And can I love myself in the identities I possess? And own that, whatever it is. Okay. And choosing for yourself, I'm going to major in this. I want to be a that. And hear me loud and clear. There is no right path, kids. There is no right path. There's no right college. There's no right path. There are 3,000 colleges in the United States, roughly. And I would encourage you to be interested in the top 5% or the top 10%, 150 to 300, not 20 places, lots of places, okay? There's no right college. I'm a Stanford person. I actually went there myself. Neither of my kids has gone to Stanford. That's 100% fine with me. I want my kids to be on a campus where they can thrive, where they're gonna find fit and belonging, opportunity, the things they wanna study, 
friends they want to be with. And there are so many places where that can happen. And I'll talk at the end about belonging because that's what brings us back to hello. All right. Um, parents, of course, you still have a role to play in the life of your grown kid. It's just a different role. And I want to kind of now talk to both of you at once, kids and parents, about envisioning making this transition smoothly. I'm going to offer three different analogies, and I want you to hang on to whichever one is working for you. One is about a dog, one is about a car, and one is about bowling. Dogs. Um, too often in childhood, uh, we parents, and I'll own it, we treat our kid like they're a dog. I've alluded to the Westminster Dog Show. This, some of you know it, if you live in New York, for sure. It's this big, amazing annual dog show where you know dogs who are fancy and purebred and all this, they are trained a certain way and they have to look a certain way and they do certain things. And you know, if they meet with the approval of the judges, the owner gets a ribbon. The dog too, but does the dog really? Maybe, maybe the dog knows. But the owner's like, look what I did. Look at my dog. Look how amazing I am. Because the owner trainer is like, got all the special messages like, you know, do this, do that and jump here and do this and go this way. Like they're really telling the dog what the dog needs to do. And that is not the right way to think about parent and child. Okay. Or if you do, you have to anticipate that at some point you're entering this dog in a free form dog show where they're off leash. And all you can do is sit and watch from behind a barrier. Okay. And you have to hope that your kid, the dog knows where to jump, knows where to go next. Uh, knows, you know, not to be on the carpet, right? Like you have to have confidence. Like they've got it because you're not leading them around anymore. Okay. That's the dog thing. Um, cars. Here's another analogy. Our kids start out in the infant car seat in the back. Okay. Then they move on to the kid car seat. Then at some point they're allowed to sit in the passenger seat while you're driving the whole time, right? You're making things happen. You're getting us all to where we need to go, right? The kid goes from totally helpless, you know, to kind of paying attention maybe when they're in the passenger seat. At some point they move to the driving seat and you're now the passenger and you don't want to micromanage that, take the wheel, but you're there for just in case at some point they can drive and you wave goodbye from the sidewalk because you're confident they've got this. Not magically they've got this, but I've taught them and now they can. That's our job as parents, okay? To move ourselves from the driver's seat to waving goodbye as they're in the driver's seat of their own life. Doesn't mean they're not gonna drive home and see you for Shabbos dinner, right? They're gonna come back, particularly if you've created a loving ease between you as opposed to a micromanaging, judgmenty parent-child relationship. They'll come back, okay? to do laundry, to eat your cooking. But the goal is to make sure they're in the driver's seat um, of their own life. The third analogy is about bowling. I don't know how many of you bowl. I hope at least some of you have, or else this won't make any sense. A bowling alley is this long, thank you, Sarah, is this long straight thing. And it's really long and narrow and it has a gutter on either side. And at the end are 10 pins arranged in a V and they're supposed, you're supposed to hit them, right? You want to hit them all. It's hard. In a bowling alley, they have these things called bumpers, which are these little rubber things that you can push a button and it's set right where the gutter is. Like if the ball goes in the gutter, it just travels down to the gutter. It won't hit any pins. If it has to have some chance of it hitting the pins, the bumpers have to be up. So if the gutters are here and here, the, the bumpers come up and that means a bowler has all of this space between here and here. They can throw the ball and it can meander and go this and that, whatever. And maybe it'll hit a pin. Maybe it won't. It could still go off here and not hit a pin. Modern parenting. So the, the analogy here that the parents are the bumpers. The kid is throwing the ball or even is the ball. Okay. Modern parenting often has us pulling these bumpers in like this. So the kid just has to throw the ball or be the ball and it'll hit all 10 pins because we're right there to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But that doesn't teach them what to do when we're gone. 
or we can't. They'll just be like, toss the ball, the ball will be over there and this and that because they didn't get to practice any of this because we were right there. Okay, so we need to be pulling our help, our responsiveness to every problem, our rescuing when they forgot something. We have to pull ourselves out here to, to the, I'm here to protect you from death. My job is to prepare you to survive. I'm to intervene if you're not going to survive. But short of that, right, you get to try and do your own thing and make your own choices and make some of your own mistakes. Why? Because that's how you grow stronger, more capable, more confident. And that's how we show you as parents, we believe matter what happens the first time, the fifth time, the 10th time. What matters is that you're getting better and better and growing to be the person who can, you know, hit all 10 pins down on your own. So hopefully one of those three visuals works for you. Um, I want to ask now, what can you do together to prepare for this transition? Because going to college, like Sarah went from Florida to Brown in Rhode Island, a thousand miles. She said, um, whether our kid is going across town or across country or to a different country, um, it's a transition and it's challenging and it behooves us all to talk about it. So I would sit down with my kid and basically acknowledge this to get from, let's talk about the car analogy, right? You've been in the car seat, you've been in the passenger seat, right? Or maybe the kid still feels like they're in the car seat, right? It's like step one, you're in the car seat. Step two, you're in the passenger seat, paying attention, like learning how to drive, but I'm still driving. Step three, you're driving, but I'm still here. Step four, you're driving and I'm gone. Okay, I would say to my kid, hey kid, what can we do to transition you from step one to step two, step two to step three? in preparation of your one day being at step four. And these are things, there, there are myriad you know, examples. So it may be that um, kid, you have some kind of medication that you take and parents are refilling your medication. That maybe that's something to put on the list of, let's teach you how to do it so that you can become responsible for that. Maybe a uh, kid, you have a therapist appointment or a uh, physical therapy appointment or um, uh, some kind of regular appointment and your parents are making the appointment for you and tracking it and reminding you, maybe you can take over responsibility being taught how, then you do it yourself. Um, maybe folks are filling out forms for you still when you got to apply for a summer thing or a, I don't know, you know, a scholarship, maybe there's a lot of, and you can sit down this time with parents and say, Hey, I need to learn how to do this stuff. So will you teach me you know, and will you be there for me to like check this with you? Ultimately, kid, you want to be the person who can fill out your own forms. Maybe it's travel. A lot of times we realize, um, you know, we're making all the travel arrangements for our kids and they don't necessarily know how. And it's sort of, oh, it's easier. We'll just do it. We know the way. Yeah, it is easy because we're the grownups. We have to teach our kids. So maybe that's something to segue. If you're going to be traveling uh, by train or uh, bus or plane to get to college one day, you know, practice making your own travel plans. Maybe it's curfew. I don't know how many families are curfew families. We were a curfew family. Um, and I knew that when my son was getting ready to go to college, that I wasn't going to know when he was on this campus in Oregon, when he was home. And I wasn't, you know, that was going to make my heart like beat. But I also believe in not being the parent who life tracks my 18 year olds because I want him to have privacy. And, um, and I want that for myself too. And so we, we did a thing of practicing once he became a senior, this time of senior year, we're like, Hey, you're about to graduate high school. You're about to be 18. Let's practice. You no longer having a curfew, um, being responsible for yourself, contacting us if you're in trouble, but otherwise you do you, I needed the practice for my own heart and soul in June and July and August, so that when end of August came and he was off at this campus, I wasn't panicked because it was the first time I didn't know did my son make it home safe. Um, we need to transition problem solving to our kids. So um, information gathering, when, our, when we have a question in a store, when we wanna know, does this store carry that? When we wanna make a reservation and they're not on open table, um, when we're trying to navigate through an airport, uh, following the signs, figuring out where the gate is. What do I do next? These are all things we can say to our kids. Look, kid, if, if we're the parent, 
uh, we've been handling a lot of this stuff for you. We want to transition you to be more responsible for your own stuff. Let's pick three things that we want to practice this month and maybe another three things next month. Um, and just really have confidence, all of us, that you're doing more and more of the thinking and the planning, and the problem solving. We're here, but we know you can, and we want you to get better and better at it. So you develop the confidence too. Here's another aspect of the transition. When problems arise for our kids, we have a tendency to swoop in and solve their problem as if it's ours, instead of empathize and empower. So empathize and when a kid leaves a backpack at school and we wanna drop everything and go get the backpack, empathize is, oh, I'm sorry you left your backpack. Oh, that sucks. I'm sorry, I hope you're all right. I hope you're, that must be frustrating. Empower is how do you think you're gonna handle it? You know, it signals, I think you can, it's not my problem. It's your problem. You can do it. I'm not, kids, don't worry. I'm not trying to say like parents should abandon you. Um, if it's a big day of a big test or a big whatever, I want them to go get their back, your backpack for you if you left it. But in the main, you got to learn to be responsible for your own backpack or whatever you've left or your sporting equipment or what have you. And um, it's super important for us as parents to, to say with our language, I believe you've got this, even though it's a problem, I'm confident you'll figure it out. Um, some people will boil it down to that sounds like a problem a 15 year old can solve, or that sounds like a problem a 17 year old can solve or whatever age you are. When our kids emotions arrive, uh, arise, they also need the empathize and empower response. Okay. But this is slightly different when a kid is afraid, when a kid is anxious, when a kid is sad, um, we have a tendency to sweep those feelings away, pretend they're not there or fix it for them, like go to bat for them for whatever the thing is. Um, so we either want to handle it, fix it, or act like it's not a big deal or just tell them to get over it. And none of those things are helpful. Our kids and kids, you know this, they want to be listened to, okay? When they're having a feeling, the best thing we can do as parents is to actively listen. Wow, it looks like you're upset. I'm so sorry That's you know, do you want to say more? Like. Just sit with them, let them have their feelings and let them see you're not leaving. There's nothing you can do or say that's going to make me walk away right now. Like, you know, your feelings are valid and they look like, you know, you look like you're struggling. Do you want to say more? I'm here for you. All of this kind of empathy. And, um, and then you can say, I have some thoughts. Maybe I have some ideas. Do you want ideas or do you just want to vent and let them be in the driver's seat of, uh, of what happens next? Um, this is our way of saying, um, I'm not scared of your feelings. Your feelings are valid. You're entitled to them. Um, and um, it's okay to be sad or anxious or mad or whatever it is. Um, we all want that, frankly. We don't want to be fixed when, when we have feelings. We want to just be able to vent and then deal and then move on. Big picture, um, we're trying to stand alongside our kids rather than drag them from the front. Come on, kid or push them from behind. <coughs> Kids, it's your life. Your interests matter most. What are you good at? What do you love? That's the, the Venn diagram, what I'm good at and what I love. That's the Venn diagram that should be your work. You gotta be good at it, but also love it to make it your life's work. Um, you get to decide from courses to major, to college, which, where to go, where to work, who to love, who to be, how to identify. It is your life. And there, like I said, there is no right path, only the path or even the next step that's right for you. I'm saying this as a mom. I'm saying this as a former dean who had pre-meds who felt they had to be pre-med, econ majors who felt they had to be econ majors with a lot of parental pressure, trying to turn kids into what the parents wanted. And I was not here for any of that. My job, my work, my newest book, Your Turn, is all about you figure yourself out and give yourself permission to study those things, be that person. Ultimately in college, and I'm gonna wrap up now and take questions. Um, thriving in college is about, do you feel a sense of belonging? And belonging tends to emerge from rituals, from human connection, just one person giving a darn about you on your campus, like Sarah's person at Hillel, Brown Hillel, Brown Rizdi Hillel, right? Even if it's just one person, a faculty member, a staff person, um, that's what it takes for a person to, after the fact, look back and say, I'm a success. Um, being mentored by just one person is uh, what contributes ultimately to 
to a person feeling successful in life, according to a huge Gallup poll. It's not where you go to college, it's where you mentored. Was there somebody there, faculty or staff, who gave a darn about you? Which, of course, brings me back to Hillel. So when you get to these colleges, wherever they may be, you will have your dormitory, most likely, or you live off campus. You will have your academic people, faculty, TAs, advisors, and you will have Hillel of the hundreds of places you may be looking at you must look for places that have Hillel because Hillel is a place where you will experience rituals that are familiar to you and maybe some new ones. You will be met by staff, people, and fellow students who are very interested in creating community where you can feel that sense of belonging to counteract the natural feelings of homesickness and what you're longing for. You are building an adult self in a new community and Hillel is, well, there's no greater friend than Hillel for a college student. So. I'll leave it there and thank you for listening. And now I'll take your questions and Sarah will join me. Yeah, Julie, thank you so much. Uh, folks, feel free to drop questions in the chat. If you would prefer to unmute and ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand, um, turn on your video if you like, or you can raise your virtual hand and we can ask you to unmute. Um, and we'll give folks a second to do that. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to say, I feel so lucky to be part of this right now because my kids are only seven and ten so i'm a little bit ahead of the game i feel like in terms of getting my head on straight i love um, it yeah. I love, you know while people are um summoning the guts to put it in a question don't be shy uh i mean i don't mean to say it like that like it's okay to be shy but i hope you'll feel that you can ask this safe space and um uh well that was a flip statement I hope it feels like a safe space for you. Um, Sarah, let's start with you. Um, um, what's the one thing you just totally kind of were surprised by? You mentioned your homesickness and maybe it was that. If so, uh, talk about that, but talk about another thing that was like, I thought I was ready for college, but, or and I have this the turned out answer. to really. Okay. So I talked a little bit about FOMO when I was speaking, you know, the fear of missing out. The biggest thing that surprised me was I had FOMO about things I knew I would hate. I knew, I know I'm not a party person. I don't enjoy parties. They're not my scene. I don't like loud music. I don't like lots of people crammed in a small space. I don't like bright lights. I know I wouldn't like it. I don't even need to go to one to just know that it's not for me. But people would go and I would have FOMO <laughs> when I would choose not to go, even though I know that I would be miserable. And it was so weird because I'm like, Sarah, why do you feel like you're missing out? Like you are so much happier with a book in your room. Why do you feel like you're missing out? But it's because that's where people were. And I feel like at college, there's a lot of pressure to be where the people are. And if the people are at an event that I love, that's super convenient. I'm there. But if people are at a thing that I don't love so much, like a party, there's still FOMO attached to it because everybody else is having an experience that I'm not having even if it's not something I think I would enjoy. So I've gotten over that because I've realized that saying no to one thing is just saying yes to whatever I need more. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saying no to a party, I'm saying yes to self-care in my room, you know? And so thinking of it that way really helped. But when I first got here, I was not prepared for that contrast. That's beautiful. And I think, uh, you know, we like to say we associated with colleges. I'm no longer at Stanford, but when I was, I would say, and my colleagues elsewhere would say, to come here is to drink is to take a drink from a fire hose. <laughs> There's so mm. much, you know. You try yeah. to take a drink of water from a fire hose, you're gonna get hit in the face. And it's not quite FOMO. It's more the overwhelmedness of the yes. options. Like there's this party and this party, and this party, or there's this thing happening at Hillel or in yep. my dorm or, you know, this sporting event, like, what do I do? And you can only be in one place. And, yeah. and we really want you to fully be where you are, you know, so don't go to the football game and then be watching something else on your phone. Like, no, be present. You know, if you're going to go to a Friday night Shabbat dinner, like go and dwell in that and be there for that. And, um, you know, if you're going to go to a party, like don't, don't think about the other places you could be like fully committed yeah. for a moment to a set of people is important. It's how we deepen our connections to humans. So I have a couple messages that have come in direct to me, so I won't name the person since they wrote me privately, but I'll ask the question. Um, where can I get your book? Uh, everywhere books are sold, your independent local bookstore, different online sources. It's in all formats, ebook, audio book that I've narrated, printed book. 
Um, where can I get this recording is an answer for um, Oren to answer or Jesse. Yeah, so um, obviously we're recording this. It'll be posted on the Hillel International YouTube channel. Um, and we will actually share that link with anyone who registered for the event afterwards. So you can expect an email um, with a direct link to the recording. Great. And the next question is, what colleges do you know of in the Florida region with the base Hillels? Some of the I Hillels can, gotta answer that. I can pop in on that one because I'm from Florida um, and I love Hillel. Um, also, is my connection okay? Yes, okay, cool. Yeah. So I have a lot of friends in Florida who stayed in Florida. Um, I have heard incredible things with the University of Florida Hillel. I have a bunch of friends who are super active there and also the Florida State University Hillel. Um, I actually have a branch of my family that is up in Tallahassee. Um, and I, if I can remember correctly, have heard great things from them and also friends at that school, um, University of Central Florida and University of South Florida. I've also have friends there who have spoken very, very highly of those Hillels. Um, in fact, the USF one actually happens to be near my house, even though I live in Tampa, which is not South Florida. Um, but I have gone to a USF like co-sponsored Hillel event and it was great. Their Hillel is also beautiful. Um, so yeah, those four, I've heard amazing things, um, but there are plenty of other Florida Hillels. Um, and if you wanna talk to me about Florida schools and about Hillel, I think that's sort of my, I'm lucky that that's my, my niche. So I'll put my Instagram in the, in the chat and you can message me. I also just dropped a link in the chat to the Hill College Guide. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a great resource. Um, when we're done, definitely check that out um, and let us know if you have questions after visiting. So I used that. I used that during oh. my college process. It tells you like the percentage of Jewish students. It tells you a little bit about the Hillel, about who you can get in touch with. When I was getting into colleges, I would go through that guide, find somebody at, at all the school's Hillels and message them and be like, hi, my name is Sarah. Like, I just got in, like, can I talk to you? And they were all super, super nice. So Sherry has asked a question in the chat, which is great. Before we get to you, Sherry, I just want to read a couple of these other questions that came in privately. Um, <clears throat> what if your child is ASD, autism spectrum disorder, I think that means, and not comparable to neurotypical teens? Um, in their trajectory, you're trying their diagnosis, their needs, best understand the supports they need in order to be thriving. And when it comes time to think about life after high school, you want to really carefully select an environment where ASD kids thrive. And there are those places. This is one of the benefits of the internet, frankly. And I always sound like an old lady saying this, but you know, in my day, you couldn't just Google, you know, I have autism spectrum disorder. Where can I, where should I go to college? But now you can. And what whatever your identity is, your community, your needs, um, you know, the internet is great at pointing you in the direction of where can you go and thrive versus like where would you kind of be kind of on the margins. Um, so that's my recommendation there. And then we have a question. What, what do you do to take these steps toward bridging, sorry, bringing more independence to your teen's life, but they had some mental health challenges. I will say to you as a mom of two who have both had mental health challenges. And here I am in this very uh, pressure filled Silicon Valley community. Um, I learned that it is imperative to center my kids mental health and wellness above all else there are, unfortunately there are too many people i know who are like my kids having a challenge you know my kids in the hospital i'm going to bring them their essays in the hospital don't be that parent okay that sends the message that all of this pressure still matters even though you're unwell and in the hospital okay when there's a mental health acute situation crisis chronic situation that kid needs support. They need therapy. They might need a psychiatrist. They might need meds. They might need a different situation. Okay. We, we must not overlook that. Okay. Boomers, Gen X, we didn't know from this stuff. Okay. We, our needs were not met today. We know better. Okay. Your kids, mental health and wellness, their wellness is the launch pad for life. Okay. So it's not, oh, da, 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 let's get them into whatever college you want them to go to and we'll deal with the mental health later. Don't do that, okay? Center the diagnosis, center the challenge. College can wait. Whatever colleges everybody's interested in, they will be there next fall and the fall after and 10 more years from now, okay? 
you don't, it's not like a treadmill, like your life is ruined if you don't go straight to college. If there's a mental health issue, center that and let life proceed once the mental health is in a place of greater stability. Okay. I cannot underscore that enough. I've kind of learned Can that. Can I add on to that super quickly? I've yes. had my, my own fair share of, of mental health difficulties. And one thing that I really appreciated that my parents did for me is that they were always, just like you said, empathize and empower. Um, and that was really, really helpful. And when you were saying, when you were talking, Julie, about that parents empathizing and empowering, I was thinking to myself, like, I hope my parents are listening, even though they've already done this, just so this validates all the things that they've done for me, just so they know in case I didn't do a good enough, enough job telling them that that's very, very helpful. Like when they listen and they're like, yes, like I, I'm so sure that this is hard for you. Um, and so that was really helpful. And, you know, mental health is also its own separate ball game in college, at least for me. Um, but one of the other things that I found really helpful that my parents would do for me is just checking in and then helping me like, like if I was like, okay, these are the things I'm overwhelmed with. They would empathize, they would empower. They'd also help me figure out how I can make it fit and how I can make it work now that I'm already here. Um, so that was also very, very helpful. Good. I'm glad you said that. And shout out to your parents for doing an awesome job. And your mom you says- confirmed in the chat. She is listening. Okay. So let's go to Sherry Friedman's question, which Sherry bravely asked of everybody. What does being in a hello mean? And how does it differ between schools? And how does it stay the same? Sarah? I got this one. So Hillel is an organization um, at many college campuses. It has a building or a room or like a physical space that you can be in. Um, obviously, that does vary between schools um, and also different schools have different programs. So at Brown, we have different like like every Friday night, we have three Shabbat services at other um, Hillel's. Maybe there will be four or five in different forms of Judaism. Um, different Hillel's have like mentorship programs and activities. So like the specific events do vary by Hillel, but at, if I'm not wrong, every Hillel will have services um, and it will have staff that are there for you, usually a rabbi or more than one rabbi um, and just a collection of people who will join the club, some more Jewish than others. Um, it's basically an on-campus organization that will allow you to get in touch with your Judaism and, and have Jewish services, events, et cetera, et cetera. Oren, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, just to just to build on everything you were saying, I, like I love that one thing Sarah is pointing out is the, the range of Hillel's. It really, yeah. I mean, every Hillel is, is different. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we really recommend that you check out the Hillel at colleges that you're considering. Um, I do want to point out, in addition to the college guide, which I, I linked to earlier, if you go onto the college fair website, one of the things that we did for the first time um, during this fair is create opportunities for you to get in touch directly with staff at many of the Hillel's. So there's, there's two options for that. One is just a direct email staff at a local Hillel if you have questions. Another is a lot of them have um, shared Calendly links or some kind of similar um, calendar booking system. So you can actually, through the college fair website, book a one-on-one -on -one meeting directly with staff at um, many of the hills out there and, uh, and ask someone's questions directly. So feel free to use that. Um, so just to build on what Sarah was saying, every hill can be so different, right? Some are large buildings, ton of full-time staff, all the way down to some are a, a part-time staff member um, and a couple student leaders running the show. Um, I would say what they all have in common is that our approach is based on relationship-based engagement. So sure, there might be services, there might be events, there might be a building, there might not, but at the heart of what Hill does is get to know the students one-on-one, -on -one, find out what do they need, what makes them tick, what are they looking for in terms of life, Jewish life, practice, et cetera, and help uh, find it, connect them, or create it. Um, but really at the heart of everything that Hill does is relationship-based engagement. It's all about people meeting people um, and getting introduced to other students who are going through similar things and lo looking for similar things. And this is why um, Hillel is so impactful and so essential, right? With my old college dean hat, I'm going to tell I said before, but belonging is what we want because when students feel a sense of belonging, they persist when there are challenges, setbacks. Okay, if they already feel a sense of belonging, they feel they have the right to go ask for help or to go to that tutoring session or to go to get some therapy or to just sit with somebody and share what they're afraid of or what they're dreaming. So we want, it's almost like the family unit is here at home, wherever that is. And we're trying to help them find family away from home, metaphorically, um, 
Hillel is one of those places that can almost literally come to feel like family. And we want that. It's not that they don't love us anymore. don't need us anymore. They do. They will always have that nuclear family relationship, but we're helping them see that there are other places and people in the world who are going to be fiercely interested in them thriving and are going to be delighted to listen and, you know, listen well and, and, you know, help them think on the biggest questions that they're grappling with in life. And Hillel offers that, um, you know, I'm always sad for kids, frankly, who don't have a particular identity-based affiliation. Um, you know, say they're not Jewish. Um, say they're not. You know, say their 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 identity is. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, it's hard to make one up. But like some kids don't feel that, find that place or space. Um, and what Jewish kids have, and Hillel is of course open and welcoming, really to so many. Um, um, as I learned when they reached out to me about how can we help black kids feel more comfortable at Hillel um, for kids who have multiple or, or connected identities, intersecting identities, um, Hillel is that space. Um, so I'm really happy for all of you um, um, that Hillel is a resource available to you. Um, there's another question here um, from Mirav. Appreciate your perspective on college as a time to sort life out in our competitive public school. There's a pressure on kids to actually figure out their passion. And well-rounded kids do not do as well in college admission. What advice do I have? Look, I was the college dean, right? I know <laughs> it just drives me nuts. Some kids know their passion in high school, small percent. It's now become normal to expect every kid to have a passion. And I just think that's absurd. Most of us who are over 40 did not have our passion figured out at 17, period. We figured it out by trying and failing at various things, okay? You're not supposed to know it at 17 if you do, all right? So go to a place that doesn't require you to apply to the school of this or the major of that. Like there are those places that want you to know from the start. More power to you. If you know, yeah, okay. If you don't know, apply to a place where you don't have to declare until the end of your sophomore year. Many, many, many places are like that. They make room and there's time for you to explore. Okay, the whole point is where in this vast curriculum do I feel so lit up that I want to do all the reading, go to every class, do all the problem sets or papers, meet the professor, talk to the other kids, right? We want you to love it that much. And that's available, but you got to do some exploring. My own kid is majoring in cultural anthropology. She did not know that major existed when she was in high school, right? Who talks about it? Okay, it's a valid field. She's thriving in it. Okay, so exploration is absolutely not just valid, but important. Frankly, I worry about the kids who think, no, no, I know exactly what I want to study and it's going to be this. I'm like, how do you know? You've just been in high school where you have eight subjects and now there are a hundred majors. Like, how do you possibly know that this is really the best place? So I'm all in favor of exploration. Um, yeah. Can I also yes. quickly add on to that? Um, I think, you know, especially in this gen and like our generation with social media, there's also a lot of pressure to do certain things or to be interested in certain things like there's a lot of pushing for specific colleges and for specific career paths um but one of the things that first of all tuning that out is very very helpful um but also when you're looking at colleges if you haven't already picked one looking into the kinds of curriculums that those schools have can be really helpful um so for example brown has an open curriculum which means that there's no core requirements. You don't have to take two math and two science and stuff like that. Um, you take whatever you want. Whereas other schools can give you more structure and they can say, you know, you're gonna take three humanities, three social sciences, three languages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so finding a school that can sort of match where you're at in your process of learning and discovering your interests um, can be really helpful. And you can also even like use that as a strength in your application. Say like, I'm looking for a school that has this kind of curriculum because this is where I'm at in my learning process. Sarah, thank you. Um, we are we are near our close here. Um, I, I want to say thank you so much to you both um, and to Adam as well. This has been so special and um, so important. Um, I wanted to say, obviously, we, we didn't get to everything. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions. We, we could never. Um, but we'd be very excited to continue the conversation, obviously. Um, I'll put our email address in the chat. Um, if you want to get in touch with more um, questions about Hillel, you can do that through the email. But mostly I just want to say thank you so much to Sarah and to Julie. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us. Um, we appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you um, tomorrow night. This is my book, Your Turn. This is what I've written for young adults. Um, it's a love letter, not in a weird way, but like it's compassionate. And it's like, I see you, I'm rooting for you. You've got this, it's your life. 
Um, and it's going to be amazing. Um, so uh, check it out if it resonates. Parents can read it too and maybe get some thoughts about how to make sure your own life is on track with whatever you want it to be. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone.